Seeing none, let us go to our first item, Mr. Samario. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Bob Samario, Acting Assistant City Administrator. Two items today. The first is a relates to the home funds. Uh, David Rao, who is our housing project planner, he will be giving the report, and then we'll move on to the, uh, the second item, which is the CAFR. Very good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Francisco and Finance Committee members. This is a request that the Finance Committee consider and recommend to City Council that they approve a request for People's Self-Help Housing Corporation for a preliminary award of an additional $500,000 in city home funds for the development and construction of low-income rental housing located at 510 to 520 North South Sequoitas and 601 East Haley Street. The project is known as Jardin de las Rosas, or the Garden of Roses. Now for a little bit of background. The City of Santa Barbara receives federal home funds annually that are used to promote affordable housing through activities such as acquisition, rehabilitation, new construction, and tenant-based rental assistance. A request for proposals, an RFP, was released by the City's Housing Division in October. People's Self-Help Housing Corporation's application meets the affordable housing priorities outlined in the City's five-year consolidated plan and the housing element. In addition, the proposal meets the RFP criteria regarding the developer's expertise in home-funded projects and compliance with home regulations and funding guidelines. The proposed project also meets the requirement for cost, financial feasibility, timing, energy efficiency, and conservation. Effective August 23, 2014, the home final rule was amended to provide that a participating jurisdiction may preliminarily award home funds for a proposed project, but may not commit funds through a binding written agreement until all other financing for the project is secured. People Self Help is seeking low income housing tax credits to complete the project financing, and, and the city's preliminary award of home funds will assist in that effort. The project has a total of 40 units. 39 of the units are for very low and low income tenants. Five one bedroom units, 22 bedroom units, 14 three bedroom units, and one two bedroom manager's unit. There's community space and an on site laundry facility. Eight of the units will have project based Section 8 vouchers. And this project was. Um, received final approval by ABR on August, I'm sorry, on April 7th, 2014. People Self Help acquired the property with financial assistance from the city's former redevelopment agency housing set aside funds in the form of a $2 million acquisition loan. In June of 2013, the city provided a $900,000 home loan for pre-development <coughs> and construction costs. The project is approved by the city and construction will commence immediately if additional funding from the March 2015 Low Income Housing Tax Credit application is secured. Reserving this preliminary award will increase people's self-help tax credit application score and significantly enhance their chance of being awarded tax credits. The project's total cost is approximately $16 million. People Self Help serves as the sole developer, owner, and general contractor for the project, and its affiliate, the Duncan Group, serves as the management agent for the development team. As mentioned earlier, the project has obtained all necessary city approvals and is ready to start construction once the necessary funding is obtained. Project financing, as you can see, the biggest item is the low income housing tax credits, which is a little over $10.4 million. Obtaining funding necessary to construct and complete the project has been extremely challenging. People Self Help has applied for low income housing tax credits on two occasions in 2014. The application process is extremely competitive, and they were very close to being awarded tax credits. People Self Help plans to apply again for low income housing tax credits in March 2015, and the additional 500,000 home funds will significantly enhance their application score and chances of being awarded the tax credits. 
This will enable them to fund, construct, and complete the project. If this request is approved, the existing home loan agreement would be amended to reflect a total balance of $1.4 million. The total principal amount will have a 3% interest rate for a term of 55 years, maturing in the year 2070. Payments will be due on the loan on a residual receipts basis. This means that no payments are due until the net income of the project after payment of necessary operating expenses is sufficient to support such payments. Any unpaid remaining balance at the end of the term is due and payable in full. Home regulations require that the project must be completed by July 30th, 2017. If the preliminary award of $500,000 of home funds is approved, People Self Help will be provided a letter to include with their tax credit application. If the tax credits are allocated to the project, staff will return to council to seek approval to formally commit the additional home funds in the form of a loan. Long-term affordability. The covenant requires that the property remain affordable to low-income residences for 90 years until the year 2105. In consideration of additional home funding, the existing affordability covenant will be amended to increase the number of home designated units from 8 to 11. The home units will be designated as floating units and distributed proportionally by bedroom count throughout the project. A floating designation provides people self-help with the flexibility to maintain the home assisted units throughout the affordable period, although the specific designated units may vary with availability. Could you define what a home assisted unit is? Yes, it's the the, the home funds are targeted towards specific units, so that dictates things like the affordability period and what the rents and income levels should be on those specific units. And so how, does, how do those requirements differ from other units in this project? That, that's an excellent question, uh, Chairman Francisco. There's a, there's a, a layered uh, amount of uh, affordability uh, requirements on this project. The tax credits have what's called a uh, tax regulatory agreement, and that has a term of 55 years, and that dictates the terms of, of the rents and the incomes on the, and the, the affordability levels of the project, which are anything from extremely low to very low to low income. Then you also have home funds on individual units that have a slightly different set of rules. And then layered over all of that, you have our 90-year covenant, which extends another, uh, what, 35 years past the um, regulatory agreement. Is that? I see. Thank you. People Self Help has been one of the city's longtime affordable housing partners. Their mission is to provide affordable housing and programs leading to self sufficiency for low income families, seniors, and other special needs groups. People Self Help is the recipient of numerous local, state, and national awards acknowledging its leadership and performance in affordable housing. They have long term staff with extensive experience in affordable housing development and management. The project meets the city's consolidated plan and housing element priorities. Um, high rents combined with a low supply of affordable housing opportunities make this project ideal for the city of Santa Barbara. Staff supports the proposed preliminary award and requests that the Finance Committee recommend that City Council approve the $500,000 home preliminary award to People's Self-Help Housing Corporation. This concludes my presentation. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. I'd also like to point out we have uh, several representatives from People Self Help in the audience if you'd like to direct questions towards them. Very good, thank you. Okay, we'll start with questions from committee members, if any. Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you go back to the cost slide? And my question is about the permits and engineering and such like, which seemed uh, out, uh, outsized the architect engineering permits fees at a quarter, over 25% of the cost of the project. It just seems way high. Anybody got, want to take a bite at that? 
No. Going uh, once, going I, twice. I don't know. If that just seems like, like a really big number for that. And 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 that to your point, these are estimates, so it's possible that some are high, some are low. So why don't I have? All right, Chairman Francisco, members of the committee, thank you. This, uh, this is Morgan Benavito with People Self Help Housing. I'm the project manager for this project. Um, and your question regarding the uh, the category of architecture engineer permit fees. There's a lot more into that um, number. Um, the app, the home application, provided uh, five categories. Um, I have a actual a detail detailed budget of you know 30, 40 line items. So you kind of have to figure out what is a similar cost and they get squeezed into this category. So there's more than just architect engineering permit fees. So I can give you an idea of what the actual uh, city and development impact fees and, and school fees are, which, um, let me see if I can find that here on the slide. Have development impact fees. I'm sorry, the the um, city fees charge like department fees for such water hookups, for example, um, or school fees um, that, that we have to Pay. Those are, those are fees, yeah. Correct. So th those are, um, if I can find them on my my list here, they're, Maybe I think, them. less than $300,000 in total. Um, the architect engineering fee is going to be around the $500,000 mark total. you got to remember that we, we've gone through a couple of appeals on this, so we've had to incur some additional um, professional fees on this project than maybe we no normally would not have. Well, I, I'm game to leave it at. Kindly uh, tease that out a little more, and maybe you could email um, Mr. Sure. Mario on that. Just that that number is, just seems way high. Okay. And let's see. There's one more. Oh, and that is to our staff. What about the home program? Can you describe that a little more? And how much of uh, where do, where does this project sit in that context? And uh, anyway, frame that for us a little more, please. Uh, Member White, I'd, I'd be happy to. The, the home program uh, is allocated out of the federal government on an annual basis. And uh, what we've seen is a, a, a fairly substantial reduction in what's allocated annually. Uh, the city gets a little bit more than 300000 a year. And it, to give you an idea, in the, in the four or five years ago, it was about eight to 900000 So in this particular case, we ran a, an RFP for 782000 which was a combination of several years and some program income off of some loans that we had collected on. And we had five applications, and between home funds and other funds, and we'll subject to council's approval, I think we're going to be able to actually fund all of them. And as far as the home program goes, each year it's, it's, it's entered into the budget uh, through Congress and the Senate, and then it's part pared down, negotiated, and we finally get a released figure. Uh, it's, it's possible that the city may not get an allocation at all of city funds because there is a rule if you receive less than 500000 in consecutive years that they have the option to not award you any funds. So what happens, so what happens in this instance if that, I mean, are we... It's just the money that we're talking about here is money that's in hand. It's not money that's... Yeah, that, that, that is correct. So that's what you're talking about. Okay. And then the, the money has been gathered, and then, uh, as you say, an RFP process has occurred. There were several applicants for... And there was the $2 million to start with, right, that the city put in. Right. And then now we're coming back with another 500000 that was the uh, housing set aside funds was two million dollars to purchase the property, the RDA, less, and then nine hundred the days. Yes, the very last funds. The in last fact. Funds, and then okay. the nine hundred thousand of home funds a couple of years ago, and this is an additional five hundred thousand of home funds for a total of one point four million in home funds. In terms of typical subsidies for the city. Uh, $3.4 million for 39 affordable units is less than 100000 and our typical subsidies have been about 120000 So in terms of our investment, assuming we get the tax credits, it's a pretty good leveraged investment for what we're getting. Well, uh, okay.
Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Mr. Hart. I don't have any specific questions about this project, but I would like to know, not necessarily at a finance committee meeting, maybe even just offline, how you track all the different projects that the city has, how, you know, the affordability, expiration dates, the number of units, the outstanding loan balances and stuff like that. I'd like to have kind of a big picture um, in my mind about all of that at some point in the future. Uh, Member Hart, I'd be happy to supply you and the rest of the committee with that information. Uh, thanks to Deirdre Randolph, we have an extremely extensive tracking system. Uh, and anything up for expiration, we try to do our best to maintain the affordability. Well, I know you're doing that aggressively, and it just would be helpful to me to understand that big picture. You know, are we looking at a wave of, of uh, affordable units coming due? Is you know, we're we're pushing these new projects far into the future, but obviously there was a period of time when we did a lot of projects and they must be coming up soon for That's expiration. correct. There are projects that are up for expiration and what we've been trying to do, if there's also a loan involved to extend the affordability and extend the loan term at the same time and, and introduce a guaranteed monthly payment so that it's a win-win for both parties. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? Thank you, Chair Francisco, members of the Finance Committee. As you know, I'm Trevor Martinson, architect, planner, and forensic, and I have represented Art Posh and the Haley shareholders regarding issues on this project. Uh, first of all, I have to agree with Mr. White. There are some funny numbers here. I, I find it difficult to believe that $9.1 million is going to be the total construction cost materials and labor. I, I have a question about that and, of course, what Mr. White mentioned. Um, again, um, and, and just yesterday I received a letter from Patricia Rippe of FEMA and the city was copied on this and she has suggested that we review the issues that we have and that our opportunity to submit a better uh, technical data on this project is still open, and so we are going to do that as soon as Dr. Posh gets back from his trip. We will be uh, doing that issue and letting the city and FEMA know. Um, this project is still out for corrections on the building permit, and there is a, a quite a, an issue, as you know, back in July when we had our last appeal with the city council, uh, Stan Mendez, structural engineer, provided George Estrella and the building department and the city a rather significant amount of corrections that had to be done to this project to make it meet the minimum building code standards. And uh, I have not seen all of this yet, but when they do finally come in with the corrections, and if these corrections have not been addressed, uh, we're just going to have to make an appeal to the Fire and Building Code uh, Appeals Board. And uh, this is, you know, something that uh, we're concerned about, and hopefully uh, we're going to be able to work this out. We do not want to say that we don't want this project. We just want to make sure that it is safe for the occupants and the families that are going to be using the property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinson. Okay, if there's no further public comment, I'll close public comment and to the committee for a discussion and a recommendation. Chair, I do have one area of, qu of question to of ask course. about, and that is if the project does go over budget, is the is the people self-help there to cover the overage? Or how is that handled in any case? Thank you. Uh, John Fowler, President of People's Health Help Housing, and uh, yes, People's is there. We've been there for 45 years. Uh, this is our fifth project in the city of Santa Barbara, and um, we are uh, in the third, hopefully, final plan check with the city, and we don't see any major issues coming up through minor corrections, so we're pretty pretty well through the process. But um, I would say as far as, uh, you know, this isn't our first rodeo. We've, we've built a few of these. Uh, as I say, and uh, our last three projects were brought in on time and under budget, and uh, 
and so we we have a pretty good in-house construction department that we believe puts these great numbers together for us and as as you know uh, staff will tell you that uh, you have to know your numbers going into the tax credit application because they can't move on you once you apply those are the numbers and the construction numbers so we spent a fair amount of time making sure and drilling down those numbers and bidding them up and making sure that those applications are accurate. So yes, we do have the financial resources, a very strong balance sheet to support any type of construction overruns, but we're not anticipating that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So uh, then I would move the staff recommendation to move forward with the $500,000 home funds to be dedicated to this project. Is that, I don't have the agenda in front of me, so okay. Is that it? Okay. Second. Very good. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Next item, Mr. Samario. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So this report will be on our comprehensive annual financial report, which we uh, love to call or refer to as our CAFR. Um, the report, the staff report will be given by Julie Nemes. She is our treasury manager, but still kind of pinching in as our accounting manager while we're doing recruitment. And we also have Rich Kikuchi. He is a partner with Lance, Saul, and Lunghard. They are our auditors, and they've been our auditors for the last four years, and one more year on that contract. Um, so I'll turn it over to Julie. She'll start the report, and then we'll shift it over to, to Rich. Good afternoon, Chair Francisco, committee members. I did bring a few extra copies of the comprehensive annual financial report, just in case you don't have your copies mm -hmm. today. Um, as uh, Bob Samaro mentioned, I'm Julie Nemus. I'm the accounting slash treasury manager for uh, the finance department. I'll be going over the CAFR, as we like to call it, for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2014. I'll be going over a few different sections. Uh, we'll be talking about the background of a CAFR, the layout and contents of the report, financial highlights, some key footnote disclosures I want to go over with you, and the audit requirements and results. As for the background, some of this might be a little familiar from last year, but I wanted to go over a little bit what exactly is a CAFR. Um, Part, what it, part of what a CAFR is, is an annual financial report that's prepared in accordance with nationally recognized accounting and financial reporting standards, what we call GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Basically, it just pre presents the financial condition of the city at a point in time, as well as the result of operations as a whole and for the individual funds. But also, it goes beyond that. A CAFR goes beyond just that financial report. It's comprehensive because it pr provides information beyond the financial report. It does this in order to qualify for the GFOA award and also to just communicate and provide more information for the reader. Then we get into why do we prepare, prepare a CAFR? Well, there's several reasons, but bottom line, the most important one is it's required, both by city charter as well as by state law. It's also really important in issuing bonds Bond rating agencies use the, use the CAFR to determine credit risk, to set interest rates. Um, and once again, as I mentioned before, it's really important for communicating important financial data to users and the public. Next, I wanted to talk about the layout and contents of the CAFR. There really are three sections of the CAFR, main sections. The first is the introductory section, and there is the letter of transmittal that is prepared by Paul Casey and Bob Samario. This gives a little information about the city as well as about the CAFR. Um, there's also some information about the city organization. It has an org chart, information about the city officials, um, some other city organizational information. The next is the financial section, and this is what is actually covered by the audit opinion. In that section is gonna have the independent auditor's report that um, Rich Kikuchi will be talking a little bit more about. It has the management's discussion and analysis, which talks has some comparative analysis from uh, fiscal year 13 to fiscal year 14. We have the basic financial statements, which is what I'll be focusing my, uh, my presentation on today, as well as the notes to the basic financial statements, which provides a little bit more information on the basic financial statements. And the third section is the st statistical section, this is unaudited. A lot of this is multi-year uh, trend data, 
uh, financial data, demographic information, and there's several pages of that in the very back of the CAFR. Now getting into the financial data, there's really two different types of statements in the CAFR. We have government-wide statements, which is prepared on an accrual basis. Um, GASB 34, I believe it was in 2001, came out and required cities to present their financial statements in a government-wide basis, which is an accrual basis showing all assets, all liabilities, very similar to the private sector. We also provide the information on in a fund financial statements. So that shows the individual funds. It's more of a short-term basis. It doesn't show capital assets, long-term debt. So the first one I'm gonna go over is gonna be the government-wide statements. This is the statement of net position. This is showing both the governmental activities and the business activities. The governmental is more associated with the local government and what is supported by taxes and intergovernmental revenues. It includes things such as the general fund, special revenue funds, other governmental funds, internal service funds. The business type activities are really more the enterprise funds, and it's what's, um, they really rely on user fees, charges for services. So the purpose here is really to identify what is the condition, the financial condition of the city at a point in time, at June 30, 2014. So the first thing we look at is in total assets, for the city as a whole, there's over a billion dollars in total assets. About 600 million of those are business type related to the enterprise funds. The remaining about 500 million relate to governmental activities. When you compare that to the liabilities, there's only about 200 million in liabilities, which is a much smaller amount as compared to the total assets. And then we look at net position. And you'll see, you'll notice that the majority of the net position is related to net investment capital assets. So what this is, is your total capital assets, including infrastructure, less accumulated depreciation, less um, outstanding debt used to build, construct, improve those assets. The next, and there's about 700 million of your net position is investment in capital assets. The next item is restricted. These are restrictions from creditors, grantors, contributors, their um, external restrictions. We have about $69 million that are restricted net in your net position. A lot of this, about $52 million, is related to the Affordable Housing Special Revenue Fund. And the last item is unrestricted. These are going to be items that are not restricted for any purpose, but they're going to include things such as, such as your non-spendable assets, such as advances. It's also going to include things such as your city policy reserves um, and also capital projects that have been assigned or committed but that are not, don't have external restrictions. Ms. Neems, could you explain or maybe give an example of a non-current liability? A non-current liability, um, an advance, advance receivable. Um, I'm sorry? Non-current liability. Oh, I'm sorry, you said non-current li liability. Um, yeah, a, a long-term debt, a bond. Okay. A non-current asset, sorry, would be advanced receivable. Okay. And do, do pension funding or underfunding, do they figure into that, that number? Um, on the government, on the, yes, it, it does. The, um, we have the net pension obligation that's on here, but it's next year when we have the, the new GASB 68, I believe it is, it's going to become a very large number. But right now, it's, it's a, just your net pension obligation, which is not a very significant number, but it will become a very large number. Okay, thank you. The next statement is actually your statement of activities. And where this differs from the statement of net position is the activity for the fiscal year is how the city did for that period of time from July 1 through June 30. And this is broken up into two, um, two parts. It's the governmental and the business type. You can also find this on page 27 if you want to look at it in, in the CAFR. The first one I'm going to look at is the governmental activities. And the main point here is what we try to look at is these are all the um, general fund, other governmental funds. And we're looking at all the functions, the admin, public safety, public works, community services, community development. How much are they subsidi subsidized by general revenues? So you'll notice that we look at the expenses, then the program revenues, we get to a net, and that's the net subsidy. So it's what we would expect, for example, public safety has a net subsidy of $50 million because public safety, which is fire, police, doesn't have a lot of program revenues. They don't generate a lot of program revenues. They really are subsidized by things such as taxes or franchise revenues or other general revenues. 
So in total, for all of the general activi uh, governmental activities, it's about $80 million of a net subsidy. Then we have about $85 million <coughs> of taxes. The other revenues are comprised of things such as franchise fees, transfers of about 900,000. And the one thing I wanted to point out, we have a one-time gain on transfer of capital assets. This just is a one-time thing that we have in fiscal year 14. During the fiscal year, uh, the California Department of Finance agreed to, it was about $67 million of capital assets that were former RDA assets that were transferred to the successor agency. The Department of Finance agreed these really do belong to the city. So they were transferred back to the city in fiscal year 14. And it, of those 67 million, about 38 related to governmental activities. The remainder were downtown parking uh, assets. So those would be business type activities. So that's why you see the gain on transfer of capital assets of about $38 million. So the total change in net position is about $51 million. But once you remove that one time gain, the total is about $13 million in the change in net position. Any questions on this one? No? All right, great. <laughs> I'll move on to the business type activities. So the difference in business type activities as to governmental activities is that we're not looking for how are the enterprise funds subsidized by general revenues. Really, they should be, each of these individual funds should have enough program revenues to cover their program expenses. So you'll notice where you have expenses, revenues in the net, the net should not be a negative number because there should be sufficient revenues. And you'll notice that all of the enterprise funds do have sufficient program revenues to cover the expenses. So for net business type activities, we have about 5.6 million in net revenues. And all of the funds, I think last year we had one fund that didn't have sufficient program revenues to cover expenses, but this year there were all sufficient program revenues. In addition to the program revenues, we have some investment income, some other miscellaneous revenues, some negative some transfers that were um, between the two types of activities. And then this is the other part of the gain I was mentioning, the 28, 29 million related to the downtown parking fund. So in total, we have a change in net position of about $35 million. But once you remove that one-time gain, it's about $6 million that really is the, the net change in net position. So these are the government-wide statements. We're gonna move on to the individual funds and the, you know, the main fund we're gonna talk about right now is the general fund. And how the general fund is different from the government-wide is it is modified accrual. So we don't uh, show capital assets or long-term debt. So the main thing I wanted to point out here is that we have about $38 million in assets. A large portion of that is cash and investments, over $20 million. We have about $7 million in liabilities and about $31 million in fund balance. And I wanted to spend a, just a little bit of time talking about the fund balance. The non-spendable is what I was mentioning earlier. It's, it's a lot of the categories are similar. They're not exactly the same with the government wide, but the non-spendable is related to the loans receivable and the advances because they're in a form that's not spendable. So we have to identify that. The restricted are balances that are restricted by external creditors um, or laws, regulations, and that's gonna include your encumbrances at the end of the year. The committed, those are amounts that are actually um, identified by city council action. So that's gonna include your city policy reserves. And assigned are, are amounts that have been determined by the city administrator or finance director. So those are gonna include things such as the uh, capital carryovers for the year, which is why it's not a very large balance. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about the general fund final results. This is one a schedule that we provide on page 89. It's part of the required supplementary information. And what it does is look at, it actually provides the original budget, the final annual budget, which is the, the amounts I'm showing here, actuals for the year, and then what the variances are. The revenues and the expenditures include the transfers as well. There's about 1.7 million of transfers in included in revenues and about 3.6 million of transfers out included in, in expenditures. The transfers in are made up of numerous items. Some of the things are SaberNet grant reimbursement to the general fund. Um, we also transferred the rental housing mediation program to the general fund. Those are a few examples. The expenditures are primarily related to capital projects. 
We have the 50% surplus that gets transferred out at the end of the year was about 1.8 million. We also have other capital projects. Um, we had the FMS replacement that gets transferred out. I believe that was around $400,000. I'm sorry? What, did, what was that last one? The FMS replacement project? What does that mean? Oh, a financial, a financial management, management system. system. <laughs> sorry. So there's uh, multiple <clears throat> other capital projects, and they're, they're mostly capital project transfers out. So in total, our revenues are to the good for about a million dollars. And, but we do have that anticipated year-end variance that we budget. So really, the, it's about 2.2 million that our revenues are to the good. And our expenditures are about $3 million. But once you remove that 1.2 million anticipated year-end variance, it's about, uh, what is it, 1.9 million. But in total, um, uh, we're to the good for about a little over $4 million. So it's, it's a good, good year. I'm sorry, I'm going to oh, sure. back up. Of course, Mr. I don't White. understand them. The expenditures, including transfers line, doesn't, uh, the, um, I'm not getting it yet. So sure. this is, we, we expect to spend a certain amount of money and we spend less than we expected. Correct. And so then that's where the $3 million comes in is we, we just spent $3 million less than we expected. Correct. So then that goes to the, to the line of savings, including that we had revenues higher than by a million dollars than we expected. Correct. So we okay. had more revenues than we expected and we have we spent less than we expected. So right. we actually had four million dollar positive variance. All right. Thank you. Just I'm sorry. Oh sorry. yeah. Yeah, one point one those are that's the budget to actual. That's just where we ended the year versus budget. Uh, Mr. Samara was pointing out that that's just our budget variance. So our actual results are comparing your revenues to your expenditures. So our end of the year result was 1.7 million. So and that was after that 1.8 transfer to um, the capital outlay fund that we do as per policy reserves. So we ended up about it was a you know at three point what is that three point six. Uh, surplus for the year and then we transfer out that 1.8 as part of our policy and so that's that's how the year actually ended up okay. okay but compared to where we budgeted we were four million dollar positive variance to where we budgeted this is a slide we often present at year end but i wanted to provide this information just to do a quick review of where our reserve balances are compared to policy reserves at fiscal year um at June 30, 2014. So per city policy for disaster reserves and contingency reserves, we were, uh, the policies require about $28.8 million. We are at about 26.9, about 30, I mean, it's about 27, excuse me. So we're about $1.8 million below policy reserves. Um, this does include that $1.8 million transfer out that we did for the 50% of the surplus. I wanted to show, I think it might be a little bit easier to see the trend. So this is the trend since 2008. And I did want to point out that that gap between policy reserves and actuals is actually narrowing. So we have gotten closer to the policy reserves in 2014 and over the last several years. There's one other fund I wanted to um, touch on. We talked a little bit about this last year because um, last year we did have a deficit and we also do this year but we actually have a new fund as well so this is why I wanted to talk about this um, it is on page 134 in the CAFR but we have a self-insurance fund that is we actually have two funds that are um, summed up into one fund on the CAFR for CAFR reporting purposes but it's made up of two funds there's the self-insurance trust fund which is what we had last year as well our new fund is the post-employment benefits fund I want to first talk about the self-insurance trust fund. Starting last year, we started having a deficit in this fund. It was um, due to the increase in the estimated claims payable. And um, I wanted to point this out because even though it's that claim, that estimated claims payable liability has decreased a little bit this year, we still are showing a deficit in this fund. So it's still, this fund is still, um, is still running a deficit. So I wanted to point that out. Yeah, sure. Just to kind of give you a heads up, it's better than when it was last year. We were about 2.6, 2.5 last year a deficit, so it's dropped down to 1.3. Um, this year, we're not seeing great results. We're seeing higher than expected um, claims costs for both workers' compensation and also for liability. 
So we are probably going to, at the end of this current year, fiscal year 15, we might be back up to over $2 million in a deficit. And as we'll talk about on the 18th, the work session, the budget work session, we are going to be re recommending an increase in funding to this fund from all the various funds, including the general fund of about half a million dollars. Because we just, the trend isn't looking good and the fact that we're in a deficit, we want to just resolve over some period of time, not right away. But th that's really why we wanted to show you this kind of a heads up. This has been an, a trend we've seen the last couple of years, unfavorable claims and the actuary saying we need more money in the bank than we, than we currently have. So we're going to have to resolve this at some point in the near future. Okay. The second fund, the Post-Employment Benefits Fund, this is a new fund that was created in 2014. Um, we moved all, in, in the past, the Post-Employment Benefits, which is going to be your retiree medical implied subsidy and your sick leave, the additional benefits we, uh, we um, allow for uh, post-employment benefits. We now moved those from the individual funds to the uh, this new fund, Post-Employment Benefits Fund, in the internal service funds. So that's why you see... Um, a large deficit in this fund. We are we are actually doing allocations to this fund to cover costs related to the retiree medical as well as the sick leave, but we are not funding the implied subsidy at this time. Do you want to talk? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing to that. So in 15, this current fiscal year, I'm sorry, 14 was the first year that we decided that we were going to start trying to get ahead of this liability that's been out there. They're referred to as other post-employment benefits, so everything excluding the pension, which we already kind of disclosed, but these liabilities have been, you know, on the, in the paper a lot in the last several years that they're growing and they're really not being funded. And so um, there's additional disclosures required, but we wanted to get a little bit ahead of that and start putting some money aside to start covering these costs that are payable in the future when people retire. So you can see we, we have about $400,000 in the first year, but we will try to try to get ahead of this a little bit more. Um, but the number down below, $13.7 million, is what we currently are supposed to have in the bank, and we don't. We have 400000 So it's going to take us a while before we get to the point where we're able to you know fully fund this. And Julie will talk about this in the next slide. The one piece we are not covering and don't have to get into this, but it's what we call is the implied subsidy. It's the fact that we have retirees who are participating in our insurance programs, group insurance programs, and they get the same rate as existing employees. So it's really a discounted rate that they get if they were, as opposed to if they were separately rated or went out and got their own insurance policy. So they are subsidized. We are required to, to disclose what that subsidy is and in a sense, pre-fund that, and that's part of the liability that's required to disclose, but we are not putting money in the bank for that. So all we're covering is retiree medical, the sick leave only, um, which is a fair amount of money, and we're also sort of trying to pre-fund our vacation just because it's a budgetary impact when somebody cashes that out. Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, and obviously, one of the sort of, to, to, to frame everything we're doing today, when we're presented, um, I mean, I haven't, I would imagine, it wasn't there on Thursday. I know it wasn't there on last Thursday, so I haven't had a chance to, this book is is uh, new to me today, and, and uh, I'll look, I certainly won't study it in, in, the, in every detail, but I will have a look at it. But going forward, so that there's many numbers here that we'd like to, at least I would like to have a little more look at over the, at our leisure kind of thing. And one topic, of course, that we've talked about, uh, I think, consistently in the last few years has been all of the benefit uh, packages, particular retirement has been a, a focal element. And we've seen, for example, uh, variables are we have a new, a new little batch of benefits that, was, uh, that the PERS board approved this year. Uh, how are those affecting us? I'd appreciate hearing about that. How many people have retired? How, how much of the how much has gone out in the last year, on in these various areas? Uh, I mean, that is to say, the the people retiring and getting that side amount. Some of that information, I think, could be helpful as a, a session to have in finance committee uh, over the next you know couple three months. Uh, just it's obviously both for us and for the public to. The, the small number of folks that do do look at the at the sure. TV version of it, I, I would appreciate yeah, uh, and we'd hearing be happy a little to, more about. We'd be happy to do that. We do that every few years. We kind of come here and talk about compensation benefits and all those things. And, and every year when we do the CAFR, we do try to point out, we focus on, on the other post-employment benefits and pensions, and you'll see other slides on that. So we try to give you a sense of where we're at with that. But, yeah, we can definitely do that additional session. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I had a question. Uh -huh. So is that... Um, 
po other post employment benefit number, that thirteen billion seven hundred thousand dollars, does that include that implied subsidy for the retirees? Yes, it does. Could you tell me the difference between the because that is to me, I understand that you have to report it, but there is actually no financial obligation to that. Um, those people are getting the benefit of us having a group. We're probably getting the benefit of the fact that our group's bigger because they're part of our group. So there is actually no financial obligation to having those people part of our medical benefits as retirees because they're paying for it. So what percentage of that $13,700,000 does that artificial um, transaction represent? I do have a slide coming up that talks about the total um, liability related to all of these benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I can go over that. That'll at least show you the breakdown. But the implied subsidy is a much larger percentage than the retiree medical or the sick leave. Well, that's incredibly important because yeah. that is an extremely deceptive number then if that is the case. Yeah, I think, you know, when we get to the next slide, I think I can, okay. um, it will help provide some light on the Thank percentages you. of the different components. Well, if I may, Chair. I mean, again, all of this is, is a good learning material. Is I would picture the older component of our, of our insured population as being a, a uh, liability, an additional liability in comparison to the, to the employee population because of, I would imagine that a, the older folks are going to be costing, I mean, if they were on their own, they're going to be a, a higher cost. So is that a, do we benefit from the larger group? Uh, yes, probably. And do we uh, not benefit from them being older folks would be the other piece of that. And for us to have a little sense of perspective on that might sure. be helpful okay. somewhere. They're only way. on until they're 65. Isn't that, that right? is correct? Exactly. Okay. But there is a cost to that. So uh, if there's no more questions, I think that's about all the information I was going to provide on this one. I'm going to move on to some key footnote disclosures. These slides should look fairly familiar to some of you. Um, we often provide information on our retirement plans. This is also in our footnotes on page 63 to 65. And what we're presenting here is what is the funded status of our retirement plan with CalPERS. The first column, the accrued liability. What we're showing is this has a valuation date of 6-30-2011. It's for the fiscal year 2014. But it shows in the first uh, column, which is called accrued liability, this is how much we should have in the bank at 6-30-2014 to fund our obligation. And then the second one, which the second column called the actuarial value of the assets, this is what we actually have. And now it's not the market value, it's just the actuarial value of the assets. The next column, which is, is the difference between the two, the unfunded liability, and then what is the funded status. So using the actuarial value of assets, we are between 77 and 79% funded for the miscellaneous plan, safety fire, and safety police. Then we look at the annual covered payroll, which is the total payroll for which the rates are based on. And we look at what, what are we unfunded, what is the unfunded liability as a percentage of payroll? And why this is important is because when there's a smaller base, it's a higher risk because you have um, less of a base to be able to change to affect those rates. So for fire, um, it's a smaller base, it's a higher risk. So the next slide is the exact same information. The only difference is that now we're looking at the market value of the assets as opposed to the actuarial value of the assets. And what you'll notice is that it, it significantly changes our funded status. In the prior slide, this is the first slide I showed you, we were between 77 and 79% funded. Using the new market value of assets, we are now between 69 and 70%. So it's about a 10% drop using the market value of assets. And why this is important is because this truly is the value of the assets. And with a new GASB statement that we actually have to implement next year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. This is what we have to use as the market value of assets when we are um, determining what the true unfunded liability is. Could you explain what the difference is between those two types of valuation? The um, actuarial uses, it's a smoothed out, I know I might let Bob describe, he describes this better than I do. <laughs> One of the things that PERS historically has done is in order to avoid volatility in the rates is that they've allowed the, the investment values or market values to fluctuate before it, it impacts rates. So it, gives, it allows it to move from between 80%, at least it used to, between 80% and 120% before it had any material impact on the rates. 
So even though you might have market value of eighty million dollars, they may still allow they may still be using hundred million in terms as an actual value of assets because it's not so far apart, and so they don't react as quickly to the rate adjustments than what they maybe should if they were really using the eighty million dollar in my example. So it just allows it to fluctuate before it had any, any short-term impact on rates. So they would sort of smooth use that as a way to smooth that because they knew that market values would go up and down. So if they look over a 20-year period, that drop may be temporary, it maybe go up in the next few years. So rather than react too quickly, they allowed it to fluctuate. Uh, and as you'll see, they, they no longer are doing that. They stopped doing that because they recognized that was a little bit sort of a funny number. Um, the real number is the market value in terms of measuring where you're at from a funded status perspective. And, and you'll see the next slide that shows where we're at more, more recently with that. This third slide is using the most recent actuarial report that we received in October of 2014. You'll notice it has a valuation date of 6-30-2013 as opposed to 6-30-2011. And this uses the most recent market value of the assets. You'll notice that, I'll just go back real quickly, um, we've actually gone uh, slightly up in the miscellaneous plan for funded status from 69 to 71%. However, for safety and fire, we've gone down in the funded status. So this is the most recent data. This was the prior data. So it's dropped from about 70% to 69%. And this is the information that we will have to use to report our unfunded liability on our financial statements going forward. So we will actually, the, act, the actuarial report no longer provides this actuarial uh, uh, market, actuarial value of assets anymore. They only provide a market value of assets. And the reason PERS will start next year with their dramatic increases to the rates over a five-year period that they're expected to be uh, somewhere close to 50% increase in rates was because well, they've had very strong returns in the last several years since the recession, and there's, there were still only 70% funded. This was pretty similar across the state in terms of other plans. And so they, their plan is to get to 100% funded by within 20 years. And so in order to get there, they have to do a five years of some steep increases, then they will level off thereafter. But that's, they finally decided that's the only way for us to get to 100% in, you know, in a reasonable period of time, rather than relying on returns being higher than what they have assumed, which is 7.5%. So. This is the table that uh, we were referring to a little bit earlier about the other post-employment benefits. This will give you a better idea of what that breakdown is between retiree medical implied subsidy and sick leave. This is what the actuarial accrued liability, the total liability outstanding, um, if we were to book the in complete liability. Um, you'll notice that the retiree medical is about 10.6 million. The implied subsidy is 22.2 million and the sick leave is about six million. So um, out of 38 million, over 22 million of it is implied subsidy. So it is, it is a significant portion of that amount. The last footnote I wanted to talk briefly about is related to streets infrastructure uh, and the PCI, the Pavement Condition Index. And we've reported several times to you on this because it is something that um, is deteriorating, deteriorating with time. Um, it's also a potential unfunded liability for the city. Under this, under accounting standards, we actually have to disclose the condition of our pavements, and so we do this in our footnotes. And this schedule actually shows the condition of the pavement, um, the estimated cost to keep the pavement condition at a, what we call a 70, and the PCI rating at a 70, and then what we actually spent per year. So you'll notice that in fiscal year 2009-10, the estimate was about 4.7 million to reach, keep that PCI rating of a 70, only 3.2 million was spent. So over time, you'll notice that PCI rate rating has been dropping pretty significantly um, all the way through 2014. You will notice there was a slight uptick between 2013 and 2014. That was entirely due to the former state route 225 being relinquished to the city, and it was relinquished in an excellent state so that gave us a small tick up in the PCI rating, but the trend is that it's gonna to continue to drop. And uh, we established a minimum of 60, and we are close to falling below that 60. And it is currently a rating of 64, which is what the city is at at the end of the fiscal year, is an at-risk standing. 
Now we move on to the audit requirements and results. Um, very briefly, the objective, what is the objective of an audit? It's really to just express an opinion as to whether the financial statements are fairly presented in conformity with generally accepted accounting principles. And also the auditors review and evaluate our internal control procedures. And our audit results were that the city received what we call an unmodified audit opinion. And what this is is a clean opinion that our financial statements are presented fairly. And also that the auditors had no disagreements with city management, no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in the internal controls were identified, and there were no indica indications of fraudulent or inappropriate activities. And Rich Kikuchi from LSL will, I'm sure, expand on that a little bit in just a moment. The last item I wanted to talk very briefly about, and I know I've mentioned this several times throughout the presentation, but we do have this new GASB out, um, statement number 68, accounting and finan financial reporting for pensions. And we talked about this a little bit last year, but why it's so important now is it's effective next year. And so it's going to be significant on our balance sheet and on every governmental agency's balance sheets. Um, it's now we're going to have to actually show these unfunded liabilities or these pension obligations on our balance sheet as opposed to just having a note disclosure. And it's also using, as I mentioned, using the market value, not that actuarial value of the assets. In addition to showing it on our balance sheet, we're going to also have to do several additional required disclosures. So um, our financial statements are going to look different next year. So I just want to um, let you know and be prepared that it is, it is going to look a lot different. So this would show up on the on the summary sheet that we started out with? The government-wide, correct. Okay. And that's the one that bond rating agencies look at? They do, um, and I'm sure Mr. Samara wants to speak too, but the, you know, the thing is it's going to be on everybody's. You know, it's gonna, every government agency has to implement this, and it's going to be a significant liability for all agencies. So I'm not sure, you know, if they're going to, they're going to have to take that into consideration for all agencies. Yeah, I don't expect it's going to have any impact on credit ratings because if it's always been there, we've always disclosed it. It's just okay. where you represent it. Now it's going to be on the face of the balance sheet versus into footnotes, but it doesn't change the, yeah. the exposure or the obligation. Okay, thank you. And unless there are any other questions, I'm going to pass it off to Rich Kikuchi from LSL. Mr. Kikuchi, welcome. Welcome. Uh, can I have that? Yeah, thank you for welcoming me here again. Uh, I know when, when you saw me, you were thinking, wow, another year went by so quickly. The auditor's already here. <laughs> but time does go by quickly, and another audit has um, just been completed. So, uh, again, my name is Rich Kikuchi, and I'm here representing LSL CPAs, your auditors, and I'm here to uh, present to you your June 30, 2014 CAFR, along with Julie and Bob, and I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about the audit process. So in regards to the, there we go. Yeah, in regards to the audit process, well, Julie just shared a bunch of information. There's a lot of information that goes uh, into that CAFR, and so, you know, in a nutshell, We've been engaged to really be another set of eyes to work with the city finance department in uh, putting together this CAFR for you. And uh, the result or the final um, product is that opinion letter as far as the auditors go. Uh, and we have, as Julie mentioned, issued an uh, unmodified opinion, which is, that's what you want. That's a, that's a clean opinion. And so in order to do that, uh, there were several hours many, many, many hours that we spent on this audit. Uh, and it all, it all started with uh, assessing the internal controls here at the city. Those, those procedures, those policies that are set in place uh, to safeguard the assets. Uh, we look at that primarily at a financial statement level. Uh, we want to make sure that the information that's being recorded in your general ledger is properly being summarized because that's the information that we use to put together this CAFR. So we kind of, we go from the, we do some testing of transactions from the very, uh, you know, the source document all the way to the posting in the general ledger. Um, oops, okay. And so it all started with um, coming out and doing our interim audit. And so we were here in the, in the month of May. And at that time we really spent 
a lot of time, most of our time, looking at the internal controls here at the city. So we did a lot of interviewing, uh, we did a lot of test work, uh, we did a assessment of the different areas um, of the city, and it, it all went very well. Uh, we feel that the internal controls established here at the city are sound, and so we felt comfortable with the information that was summarized in your general ledger. And so then we came back out in September, and at that time, uh, that's what we call our year-end audit, and at that time we basically uh, focused on all the account analysis, all the work that we needed to do uh, in order to um, render an opinion and also help to assist and put together this comprehensive annual financial report. Um, like Julie mentioned, there's the basic financial statements. There's also the fund level, the footnotes, and also the statistical section and uh, the MD&A. So we are part of that, that whole process. And as I mentioned, we did a lot of test work, a lot of hours, and you know that's a big document that you have, uh, but it really is not indicative of all the hours that we spent and Julie and Bob spent, uh, you know, putting that that document together. But based on the test work that I put in and my staff put in, uh, like I mentioned, we have issued an unmodified opinion, which is. Uh, the clean, a clean opinion, that we feel that the amounts in that document are materially correct. And uh, you can make decisions based on that. And we feel that it's a good snapshot, it's a good summary of the, of the financial results at June 30, 2014. The products that, that come out of our audit are, well, there's three of them. Uh, the first and the primary one is the CAFR. Uh, there's also two other letters that we issue. It's the uh, SAS 115 or the internal control letter and also our auditor's communication <coughs> letter. Uh, and the SAS 115 letter, you know, during the course of our audit, uh, like I mentioned, we, we look at the internal controls of the city. We, you know, we're, we cross various departments. It's not just in the finance area, but we're looking at different departments. If during the course of our audit uh, we felt that there was a, a, significant, a significant deficiency in internal controls or there are, were a material weaknesses that we might uh, want to uh, report to you, because we are reporting to you, uh, we will put that in that letter. Um, there was nothing that came to our attention that warranted uh, reporting to you. So, you know, it's a quote-unquote clean letter. Uh, the, uh, the, audit, the other letter which we issue annually is that auditor's communication letter. Um, in there, and actually Julie mentioned that on, on one of the slides, so we, we would put in that letter things like if there were difficulties or disagreements during the audit, uh, we would report that to you. Um, we talk about significant uh, accounting changes. Uh, we talk about the new GASBs that are coming up, and, and we touched upon that, GASB 68 is the big one that we've been talking about actually for the last couple of years. I think we've been talking about that where the uh, pension liability will be on the, the uh, statement of, of net position. And so that's, those are the type of communications that we put in that letter. Uh, yeah, I guess we can skip to the next one. Uh, yeah, so there were you know, there were no there were no significant audit findings or, or issues that we really needed to cut, to communicate to you in our auditor's communication uh, communication letter. GASB sixty eight. Um, I think one other thing I just wanted to point out regarding that is, um, it's really financial statement. It's it's a financial statement reporting. So we are going to report the liability on the statement in that position. That it's for the whole case of transparency, but it doesn't really, it's not really reported on the city's books. It's kind of an unusual thing. It's, it's for my financial statement purposes only, so it doesn't really affect the general fund or any other fund. The liabilities there, and uh, so it just kind of gives the reader uh, more of a, a clearer picture of what that unfunded liability is. So I just wanted to mention that to you. So, 
Yeah, we put a lot of work into this. And that document, that CAFR that you have in front of you is, um, you know, we abide by all the guidelines that the GFOA has established. There's, um, there's, all, there's actually a very long checklist that we need to follow in order to make sure that it's a, a award quality so that we would, uh, uh, that the city would get the uh, award for uh, excellence in financial reporting. City has been doing, has been receiving that, that award in the last few years, and it's because of the hard work that Bob and Julie have been, uh, been putting in, and auditors have been part of that too. It's a joint effort, and so uh, we're, uh, we're fully expecting to get the award again, and we'll be issuing that for the GFOA award. And uh, so that CAFR is in accordance with all those guidelines and also all the, the GASB standards that seem to be coming up all the time. So in summary, um, LSL has been engaged to perform a financial audit, and um, we have issued an unmodified opinion on those statements. That snapshot at June 30, 2014, and we've issued those two other letters to you that were quote-unquote uh, clean letters. Um, I do want to use this opportunity to thank Bob and Julie, especially Julie, well, just amazingly hard work it was putting this thing together this year and I uh, just wanted to point that out and um, but we feel really good about that document that you have in front of you and that's kind of a snapshot of the audit and the financials and I'm certainly here to answer any questions if you might have any regarding the audit. Mr. Hart, any questions? Mr. White? Mr. Kikuchi, when you talk about all the hours that your staff put into testing, yes, could you just give an example of what that is, make it a little more concrete. Uh, as far as the type of testing or the volume of hours? Uh, type of testing, actually. Okay. Um, well, when we come out at the interim, that's where we're centered upon um, looking at the internal controls. So we, there's a variety of test work that we do, say, for instance, on um, disbursements. We might uh, select a particular check we might uh, judgmentally select a particular check, uh, look at, make sure it was has a, a properly approved invoice, make sure that that invoice has been properly, uh, is mathematically correct. We, we will determine that it was properly coded to the right account, and then we will trace that posting all the way through the general ledger, making sure that uh, not only was the cash relieved in the proper amount, but it was also expensed in the proper account. So that's an example of that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Just two comments. One, what Mr. Kikuchi mentioned is true. The auditors report to the city council when we bring them to the finance committee. They they work with us, but they really report to you. So they're not, they're going to report to you whatever, they're required to report to you anything that comes up that's whether internal controls or disagreements and, and so forth. So that is correct. The other thing I want to point out, and I'm going to actually let Julie do this, is to recognize two people who are in the audience um, who really worked super hard in this project. I just wanted to take a, a quick moment to acknowledge James Hamilton and Lynn Sparks. They're two of, uh, without them, this capper wouldn't exist, to be completely honest. But they are from the accounting division, and they worked for six months on producing this report. So I just want to take a minute to thank them for all their hard work. Thank you, very much. Thank you both. Okay, anything else? Do we need a recommendation on this, Mr. Samario? We do. So just to accept the, the report and to recommend to council their acceptance, we are going to be presenting a modified version of this report to council. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll, you can, can take that action. That'd be great. Okay. I'll move those recommendations. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>